Welcome back to episode three of the Modern Mama. Today I have with me a longtime friend, Inika Henson. Hi, Inika. Hi, Nishma. I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. So welcome to um, this episode. And uh, you and I have known each other for over 25 years. Yeah, to be honest, I have to think back. It's been a long time since I arrived in England. Yes, and uh, we, we know each other through our husbands. Yep. They used to live together, work together, and I think you were you were a house house uh, mate of theirs as well at one point. Yes, I literally moved in. I just left my other job. I went to the Netherlands for about a week, I think. Jumped in my car and never looked back. I literally moved in with with yeah both our husbands. Not at <laughs> not at the time, obviously, but. <laughs> So, um, you're a mother of, of three children. I am. Uh, one daughter and two sons. Yes. Now, I always say I had a past life, and that past life is usually before my children. So, tell me a little bit about your past life. Yes. Well, I have those lives as well. I have life <laughs> before kids, life after kids, and then there will be, I'm sure, another life after that. Um, yeah, from where do you want me to start? From... Just tell me a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, so I grew up in, an, in a tiny village called Hattem in the Netherlands. Um, I could walk to school. I was one of five. I was, I was number four. So I have one younger brother after me, and I've got a big brother and two big sisters above me. And it was, it was Mayhem House. Um, we just lived in, an, in a moderate house. But we were surrounded by dogs and animals, and it was always people going in, going out. Um, I think one of my my memories was always that I can't remember. It's a weird memory if you can't remember, obviously. That like my elder sister wasn't there, so that was thinking back at the time. You know, it was one of those things that I just took for granted. But my elder sister is a bit older and already moved out. So although I'm one of five, it's almost like I feel I'm one of four because I never really consciously lived with her. Um, so how much older is she to you? Right. She is 12 to 13 years older than I am. So, oh, you know, okay. as a child, yes. when you consciously think about your siblings, I mean, yes. for me, it was about like eight, nine. And then my memories of, of my then elder sister, who's eight, only eight years older, she was always, you know, taking me out, playing with me, taking me to the park, things like that. Um, I could walk to primary school, and that was lovely. And I that still, is nice. yeah, and I still remember. That's one of those wonderful memories. There was a railway line that still connected, you know, my village with another village. And in the time that I was in primary school, that was taken away. And I still remember the last trains going by and putting like. Um, we had cents, you had pennies, on the railway, and I'm running back, and the train coming over, and it's like, oh, yes, we have a flattened penny, you know, or flattened cents. It's one of the <laughs> weird memories I really have. Um, and the other one is, so secondary school, I had to cycle to. So I had to cycle for three quarters of an hour to an hour to my secondary school in the morning and then cycle back. And that was regardless of the weather. And the weather was somehow more extreme. So that was one of those memories. Because you compare, don't you? I grew up in the Netherlands. I'm in England now. You always compare yeah. those kind of things. And, and one of the memories is that it was in the middle of winter. And it was about, what would it be, minus 10, minus 14. And I would cycle to school. And I didn't have my gloves on and my, my scarf on. And my dad telling me. You need that on because it's cold. And God knows why I remember that particular memory. And yes, he was right. It was really cold with my stand on the bike. <laughs> That's why you remember it. <laughs> That's why I remember it. Was so, it. so yeah, that, that was my life then. I moved, you know, skipping ahead. Um, I did the hotel management school in The Hague. And that's why I started traveling. And obviously then... You link it in why I came here. So I did an internship in Paris and then I ended up in um, Jamaica. And then from there, I actually haven't been back in the Netherlands yet. So it's a very, very short, um, yeah, 
life before kids, but I would say life before England, really, because that's that's a yes. real big difference of my life in the Netherlands as my life in England and then kids. Yes. So what brought you to England? Right. Would you like the long version or the short version of that one? <laughs> Entirely up to you. How long have you got? <laughs> no, I've had my coffee. I'm fine. I can do this. So, yes. So, in Jamaica, that was my last internship. I worked in a hotel because, of course, hotel management, and I worked in, in a hotel there. And you have the holiday, holiday reps there. So, one of the holiday reps was Dutch. And me being Dutch, you kind of get together and we formed yes. a group and we would go out. Um, a whole lot of us, not just Dutch people, but, you know, Jamaican people, mm. other hotel reps. It, it was a lovely group. And he had a girlfriend at the time and that, who came over and we kind of got on with each other. She was Italian and lived in Malta. But at the time, it wasn't a detail that I really, you know, filed away. She was just he was a Dutch, Dutch mm. friend and she was Italian girlfriend. We got on. It was lovely. I met an Italian boy there, and we got on really well. So when it was time for me to go back to the Netherlands, so Jamaica, you have to think, lovely, sunny. I went back yeah. to the Netherlands oh. in January, minus 10, minus 15, grey, drab, and I was like, no, this is, this is just not for me. I'm not happy in this, in this weather, in this climate. So well, you've been in sunshine exactly. and golden sand, yeah. so... It's going to look drab, isn't it? Well, it's not even that. It's, you feel so, well, for me, that's personal. I was so much better in sunshine. It was mm. literally, life was lighter. It was easier. So it was definitely for me. I know it's not for everybody, the sun, but yes, I, I, I was born in the wrong country for that. I can tell you that. So phoned that Italian boyfriend at the time. And said, I'm coming to Italy, you know, I just need to get out. And he was like, absolutely fine. So a couple of weeks went by, booked my ticket, phoned him on the airport, got his mum, who didn't speak Dutch or English for that matter. So somehow, I don't know who managed, I think somebody was passing by who did speak Italian, said, well, actually, <laughs> he's in South Africa. I was like, okay, then. So I'm here in Schiphol, Amsterdam flying to meet this boy who's now in South Africa. So I had two choices. I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, no, I'm going. And this was at a time when you have to think about, you still had the old-fashioned suitcases, so nothing on yes. wheels. So there I was mm -hmm. on my way to Italy with my suitcases on a plane. And on the plane, I realized I actually have nowhere to go. So I was flying into Bologna and spoke to the stewardess at the time, who was like, well, I can't help you. And Nish, I have been really, really lucky because this guy turned around and said, well, I can take you where you need to go. Anything could have happened to me because I was so trusting, jumped in this yes. guy's car and no, true to his word, he took me to a youth hostel, but I could have ended up anywhere, you know? So it's, it's one of those things that you look back on life that now being a mum, you think like, oh my God, it's so good. How my, yeah, how my mum never knew, which was brilliant. Um, and in the youth hostel, I phoned that then girlfriend who was Italian. Yeah. Who worked for Alitalia. And she said, you know what? Come to Malta. And I was like, where is Malta? I had no idea where it was. <laughs> so anyway, got out of the youth hostel took a bus to the train station. I think I got on the train about a ticket because I didn't speak any Italian. And I was like, do you know what? I just get on. I had to get to Rome. On the train, I got to talk to a couple of guys, which is really nice. Mm. Um, got off the train in Rome and they were wanted. So they got arrested. <gasps> oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and because I was with them, I was picked up as well, but they were brilliant. They said, no, they, I, they, I just talked to her. We just met her on the train. You know, it's got nothing to do with us. But I was in this police station <laughs> and basically had this preach in Italian that I kind of picked up because I know French and, you know, there yes. are similarities. So I got the gist of, 
you have to be really careful who you talk to. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I know all of that. So they kind of in Rome, somehow we got to the airport. I really can't remember how. Jumped mm. on the plane to Catania because it wasn't a direct flight. Right. And Catania being in Sicily. So I got mm. off there and had to get a connecting flight to Malta. But there was no space. And I remember having this run in because there was this one, you can go on a jump seat. Yeah, so you can yes. go in, you can go on the jump seat. And because I kind of got fast tracked by my by my friend, um, this lady came to the desk and said, I really need to get on. And me being Dutch and quite direct, it's like, yeah, so do I. <laughs> so we got in a kerfuffle with this Italian lady. I think I lost. I think, not quite sure, I can't remember. But you got to Malta. Well, yeah, also somehow. With the, yeah, or somehow I got to Malta. And I think I was firmly protected somehow because I was ripped off by an Italian barman as well. And I remember this, this you had the ground stewardesses and yes. basically got me by the arm and said, right, come with me. And I thought, oh my God. And she completely laid into him. And this was at a time that every country still has its own currency. So in my oh, yes. wallet, I had, you know, Jamaican dollars, American dollars, Dutch guilders, Belgian francs, French francs, Italian lira. And I, it, it all kind of had to get together. And she laid into this barman who kind of ripped me off. So I got this wad of money. I wasn't even aware. So I had, if you think about that journey, I'm telling you like that because it's, I was protected somehow. I really felt like, oh, my God, somebody's looking old for me, which was just lovely. And I always felt, just going back to my childhood, but, but pa- my dad had passed away by that time. And I felt, yeah. I felt not invincible, but protected. So I got but to Malta. Those days were different. Yes. People did look out for each other yeah. and were trusting. I think nowadays... We wouldn't trust our children with anyone, no. unfortunately. Um, I mean, yours are younger, but I know what you're saying. I, I remember getting, well, not getting lost, but forgetting my way home. Um, I was about seven. We'd moved house, and my dad had said he was going to meet me for the dental, dentist appointment. So I was standing there, and then I don't know how long had gone by, and I started crying. And this lady came to me, and she said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know how to get home. I said, I know where there's a shop, which is a family friend shop. I know how to get there. And she took me there and, and left me with them. And I knew them. Um, but what they forgot to do was ring my parents till after they shut the shop. So my parents, by this time, I think were almost had the police out yeah. there for me. And then they said they, they just turned up with me at, their, at my house. And they were like, oh, my God, where have you been? They went, oh, she's been with us. Oh, but they didn't phone. But it was a different era, different yeah. times. Yes, it's but, it's, um, it's really, really scary. A lot of freedom at that mm. time. And yes. then in Malta, now a really long story, I'm cutting it short. Um, I moved in with that friend who had another friend mm-hmm. and got a job as a holiday rep. Because they asked me, do you speak German? Pff, yeah, I'm Dutch. Of course I speak German. Which was, oh, fantastic. Yes, wasn't quite German, but I had a good time. And then somewhere in June, I came home after a really hot day um, wearing uh, the winter uniform because the summer uniform of that company was just hideous and I refused to wear it. So it was (laughs) plus 30. I was in my thick winter uniform and I was in a really bad mood. And at the table, a friend kind of introduced me to his friends and I was like, I'm not in the mood. I'm not interested. And it happened to be my husband to be, Sean. (laughs) completely ignored him, was completely rude, but obviously he saw something in me because he tried really, really hard. Now, at the time, you had to think, I was this tall, Dutch, blonde lady, so the Mediterranean men really, you know, it's, how do you call it in English? It's it's kind of cliche, you know, it's like Mediterranean men, tall, blonde girl, but I had my share of interest and I was done with it. I wasn't interested. But Sean, as you know him, looks very Mediterranean. So I just thought, yes. like, yeah, I thought like another Mediterranean guy, not interested, thank you very much. But no, he was but different. But Sean has the patience of oh, a yeah. saint. He does. And just, just a bit of context. Sean is 
British English, yes, isn't he? Is. he? Yes. But was brought up in Malta, is yes. that right? Yes, he was born in Malta, brought up in Malta. So he came back to visit his family. Um, he was just on That's a two-week right. holiday. He was just on holiday yeah. and getting back in the country that he grew up with. But he looks Mediterranean. So he's a dark Very. complexion, dark yeah. hair, dark eyes. And I didn't know him at the time. Um, but obviously I got to know him. He tried really, really hard. I also tried really, really hard to ignore him. And then on the last day, it kind of clicked and connected. And we had a telephone conversation for a long, 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 long time. Even won a prize with it, believe it or not. So we wrote about this story that I just told you, and we won a prize. Because we had this long, we had a telephone relationship. So I would phone him in the middle of the night after he had worked and I came home after having won too many. It was like, you know, it's like, I miss you. And he still remembered those conversations. Um, <laughs> holiday wrapping wasn't for me. So I kind of quit. There's only so many complaints about, you know, the decoration of a hotel room you can deal with. And oh, yes. phoned my mom and said, I've saved a thousand guilders. Can you buy me a car? She did that. Spent a couple of weeks with her and then jumped in the car, drove to England and never looked back. I moved in with Sean, which is really amazing because we never, I would say, would you say, courted. So we never went out physically because we had to tell right. we had this telephone conversation. And this was the time that Sonny, or my husband and your your husband now, Sean, were, were staying together. Yes. And uh, you, I think you must have turned up in the middle of the night. I and did. Sonny woke up in the morning and found this woman in the flat. Yes. <laughs> like, who are you? Well, the thing is, he would have had a chance. You'll never forget that day. Well, he would have had a chance to meet me because I did spend one week with Sean in between because it was really like, I need to meet this guy. But uh -huh. he was with you at the time that week. He took that week off. So I don't think I ever right, met yes. him until I moved in. No. And yes, he woke up one morning and was like, there I was. <laughs> but it was an interesting time, Nish, because Sean wasn't used to having a girlfriend because we never dated as such. Court it is a bit old-fashioned, isn't it? It's dating. Yeah, so we never yes. dated. Um, so I would spend a lot of my evenings with your husband-to-be, which was yes, amazing. That's right. Yes, so I'd cook, he'd come home, and we had an amazing time. I think I see more of Sonny than of Sean at this given time because Sean was so used to working all hours of the day to come home in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And that's when my life in England started. <laughs> yes. And yes. then you got, I mean, you, you, you and Sean travelled quite a bit. Uh, yes. You got married in Malta. Yeah. And then... I, I remember at one point, now I can't remember if it was before your first child was born or after, but you were looking to move to Australia. You'd done a world tour, hadn't you? Yes, we did, we'd taken three months out and we'd done a world trip. Right. It's always been one of Sean's dreams and I love travelling. Well, I met him during travelling, really. Yes, um, And we right. did this lovely round the world trip and came back, loved Australia and applied for all the papers to go there. Yes. That's right. And you, you had you had it all, didn't yeah. you? You had yeah. it all ready to go. All ready to go. Um, and then and then your first child was born. Yes. Sana. Sana was born 16 years ago, plus a couple of weeks. Wow. She just had a 16th birthday. Um, yeah. And it's very exciting. You're you're we're having this conversation at a very exciting time because she's just done her GCSEs in lockdown, so to speak, um, and is ready Goodness. to move on. I know. Yeah. We were still going to go to Australia with her. So we did, yes, when she I was remember. little, I think in her first year, she'd see more of Malta, the Netherlands and Australia than she'd had of England, to be honest with you. We travelled a lot with her and were still ready to go. And then number two um, came along and we were like, still wanting to go, skipping ahead, and then number three came along. <laughs> And that was, okay, we're going to stay now. Yes. Yes. So you have Sana, who is 16, yep. and Noah, who is 13 now. Well done, and yeah. Qu Quinn is 10? 10, 10 right? yeah, 10, 11 in June. Right. Yeah. So this is where, 
I guess, the next chapter of your life started. Yes, motherhood. motherhood. Oh. And let, let's talk a little about being the mother for the first time. How was that for you? Was it what you expected? Um, no, you know, no. How was it? It was scary because obviously I came into kids quite late in life. I really wanted, it was a conscious decision. I wanted to enjoy life. I wanted to yes. and I wanted to to feel what it was to have a job. I had a lovely, lovely job, um, and but I felt I was ready for the next stage. And mm -hmm. it's for me, it's, it's it is an adventure. It's like it's it also felt like it's going to complete me who I am. Felt pregnant, did the regular twelve week feeling really rubbish and sick. And it was over. I had a lovely time carrying my child. I was fit and healthy. Yes. Um, had the birth was something different. I was very much into yoga at the time, and I was yes. I was right. definitely going to do it without painkillers. I wanted to have the the whole bit, the whole hog. I wanted to have the whole experience. Yeah. Um, yes. As we all do. As we all do, and it doesn't always go to plan. I know. Mine did. To a certain extent. So I had my lovely baby. At the time of birth, something went wrong. And I was in a lot of pain. So my first experience wasn't that great. I slipped my disc. So I was in a lot, a lot of pain. So when she was a couple of months old, I had an operation, which was really difficult. Because I was determined also like to breastfeed. It was a real connection. I was really, you know, I was so into that. And it took yes. me a lot of effort to keep that going because obviously with an operation, anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But came all back to it. And she was just gorgeous, Nish. She was everything she was. you want in a baby. She was happy. She cried, but she was lively, healthy. It was a beautiful time. I loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. So, yeah, apart from the little blip in the beginning, love pregnancy, love being a mom. And it was just beautiful. I think it changed with the second one because you have to split your time. That's right. Yeah, you do. So you do. the motherhood changes with the second one. It might be different for other people and it might be different for the kind of child you have. And it changes again with the third one. And I'm sure when you have your fifth and your, your fourth and your fifth, my mum will probably tell you stories about that. It changes again. <laughs> but we're not going to go there. Let's stick with the first two, three. Yeah. Yeah. So three years later, Noah came along. Yeah. That was completely different. So. How, how was that different? Uh, it, I was feeling sick pretty much the whole pregnancy through. Really tired. Um, had a very lively toddler, which didn't help. Yes. Noah came also with a water birth like Sana, but somehow okay. really quick. It was almost like my body said, no, we're not going to hang around here. Out you come. And out he yeah, came. That's exactly what happened with my second birth. Was I it? mean, I, had a, I heard a midwife saying, help, there's a baby delivering fast here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was so in the I, water. I that is something I'd wanted, but they didn't do it where I where I was giving birth. But water births look amazing. It's it, I was lucky because there's only one yeah. big bath, obviously, because it takes up a lot of space yes. and nobody was in it. I think it was quite new at the time, maybe as well. Um, and I really, yeah, I wanted to do that. So, so you had all natural birth. Yeah, yeah, all natural birth, natural. all with. Nothing really, no gas and air, no nothing, just breathing. Fantastic. I so believe in the power of the breath, but that's a different story. Um, but I felt connected and I felt great. I was amazing. But mentally, I was much worse off. Um, so physically, I was much better, stronger. Mm -hmm. But mentally, I felt like, like a wreck. I found it really difficult to have this baby... And I felt nobody gave me instructions. Nobody gave me, what am I going to do now with my second baby? So I have my toddler, but nobody told me how, how to do that. Um, Noah was also different. So as you know, Noah has special needs. Yes. Beautiful boy. Um, so it was very stressful. When he was six weeks, I knew there was something not quite right. At 
the time, I thought he was literally mentally and physically completely disabled, but we didn't get any, I was, I was well supported by the hospital and the GP, so they took my, my worries completely serious, but they couldn't find anything. So I grew up with a big worry for my second child, as my first child was worry-free. And that contrast mm. was yes. really difficult. Um, yeah. And as you know, with Samir, I had you had, I had to say yeah sim- similar similar anxieties and issues. Yeah. Um, and it is because you go by the first one, and if that's been, as you say, quite normal, straightforward, you know, and the first one is very different because you've got all that time to yes. give that child, yeah, and now you're having to split your time out it is you're, you're right that nothing can prepare you for that no um that time but then you but you were supported by your doctors and yeah they took, I mean as a mother you know instinctively you know there's something not right don't you yes and I am a what they call probably I've only heard the phrase later I am a tiger mom and I will fight for my children um that's later okay. in his life um so I would have put you down as a tiger mum, but uh, well, interesting. Maybe, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that afterwards. Yeah, talk about it afterwards. So maybe because obviously with the, the understanding that I got later and maybe it's a different it's different reference now. But yeah, let's let's go back to that first year mm. with Noah. Was quite yes. different. He also had hyperspadias, which um is to do with the urinary tract coming out slightly different than it yes. actually is. So he had to have an operation early in life as well, which didn't help. Hmm. So he, Noah, Noah was different. And Sana was complete opposite. And that contrast was really, really strong. Um, but he grew up and it, it was, his physical disability wasn't there. So that was good. He was a little bit slower in everything, a little bit lo- it took him a little bit longer to crawl, a little bit longer to walk, a little bit longer to potty train. But then I have an incredibly fast daughter. So my daughter yes. was potty trained really fast, spoke mm. really fast, um, did everything yeah. really fast. And it's still that contrast. Almost, yeah, but it's almost unfair now when you look back to think you we compare them to the one that we've already had and but we know no different at the time do we so that's all we have to go by yeah and there's all people always say don't compare well I always say compare but don't judge don't mm. analyze yes. every child especially in their own way so yes I compare Absolutely. but I don't judge I love both my kids equally and now yes. free obviously um, so Noah grew up and then he, he didn't talk. He's 13 now. He still has speech difficulties and language delays. Um, and that was a worrying time in my life. Hard, hard time. Um, and then number three appeared. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> was that expected? Unexpected? It wasn't planned. Let me speak. Yeah, it wasn't planned, but he is, as my sister put it nicely, he's my little present. And he put uh-huh. everything in perspective. So I have two contrasts. Yeah. My my third son is smack in the middle, completely different from the other two yet again. Um, yeah. And his birth, because we did speak about birth a little bit, is yeah. is different again. So... With your third one, you kind of know, don't you? So You do. Yeah. I didn't feel anything necessary, but on the Monday evening, I decided enough is enough. And I said to my husband, just take me to the hospital. And they did. And they they put me on the monitor and he said, nah, yes, there is movement, but nothing yet. Go home. And I was like, not sure about that. So I remember the times. I remember I was sent home at 7.30, came home at 8 wanted a big bucket of ice cream because that was my craving at the time so I had my big bucket of ice cream and I was in bed and it was 9 30 and I said to Sean like no I said honestly phone the hospital right. yeah so he phoned and he got the funny response well hospital is closed whereas my husband said well the baby doesn't care about closed hospital really <laughs> <laughs> we're coming we're on our way 
and and you know you know Sean a little bit, yeah. You know how he is. Yeah. Okay. So absolutely. Yeah. So we're sitting in this car, yeah, and it's June, so it's light still, and yes. um, <laughs> there is this car, and I can't remember if it was a Maserati or a Ferrari or whatever, having a pregnant lady in the car about to give birth, and he said, "Ooh, let me race that car." Where I was like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> So he wasn't racing, obviously, but just a phrase sums up my yeah. husband, doesn't it? <laughs> so I was there holding my belly, my big belly of nine months, and it was aching, and I blamed it on his driving. So I came in the hospital, and my husband said, yes, you want a water birth, whereas the midwife said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And then my husband was, you don't know my wife. She really wants a water birth. Whereas the midwife, that pen said, yes, but she's nine centimeters. It's not going to happen. At that time, I still remember like, oh, nine centimeters. That's great. This is my last one. I've never tried gas and air. Can I try gas and oh. air? <laughs> Lying on this bed. I had one gulp of gas and air. And I was like, yeah, that's not for me because it makes you go a little bit woozy. Woozy, it does, yeah. yes. And I want to yes. be in control. But I did use it. So what I did, I took a normal breath in through my nose and just used it to breathe out in. And yeah, two minutes past 12, my other son is born. <laughs> there was no water birth there. Uh, no water birth. But in a way, you know, going back, Sean kind of with his racing this Maserati malarkey, took my mind off the contractions which was really nice <laughs> <laughs> so number three was born and yeah that was middle it was like mentally i was in a good way physically i was in a good way and it was yeah brilliant he was my little present put everything back in perspective and i had three children yes you did. <laughs> and then we moved house. <laughs> so we, Was that when you moved to the, the present house? Yeah, so I was, I was pregnant That's at right. the time. So we bought this big house, which was a post office and a shop and an 1860 cottage and a 1970s house. So we're higgledy-piggledy. And obviously we decided to completely rebuild that in the middle of pregnancy with two little children. Not the best decision, looking back at it. And then me being me, in December, I'd had enough. I was like, no, we're going to move now in a half-renovated house with two children. No, three children at the time because Quinn was born. Six months at the time. And that was hard. That was difficult. It was really hard. Mm. Yeah. So that's, um, so yeah. And having the other two, how was that now? Because you've had this baby, third baby. Now it's juggling three because, you know, yeah. nobody prepared you for number two. No. So how was it with number three? And again, Sana was how old by then? Five, five years old. Five. 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 So you've got a five-year-old, yeah. a two-year-old, um, and then you've got yeah, Quinn. Yeah. Yes. Quinn. And, I mean, putting the house aside and all that, but concentrating on the children, how how did you find that whole experience? Very stressful. How you cope with that? Very stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Very stressful. Um, Sana is an easy child, so but she was a lively five-year-old. Yes, yeah. she was. And but very happy. Um, and Noah needed a lot of support. So Noah, knowing him now, is is a very clever child, and, f- and you could see he was frustrated by his Mm. inability to communicate. And I still remember that I asked him, you speak a different language, but mommy doesn't speak that language. And he nodded and he was three to four years old at the time. Um, And then you have Quinn, who was also a lively boy as well. So I have lively children, as you know, I have lively children, but I'm lively as well. You probably can hear from the way I talk, you know, I'm quite lively. So, yeah, unfortunately, my kids are as well. So, no, it was a very stressful time. The attention that you have to give each 
and every one of your children, but they have different needs. They need different attention. Yes. And that hasn't stopped Nishma. So from that early period to even now, their needs change and you need to accommodate for that. Yes. And I have to say, it's a mindset. So I could have gone in the, I'm completely stressed out and going into nervous breakdown. Or you change that around and say, do you know, this is an adventure. This is a challenge. I can do this. And you find ways of coping. And yes, with the right mindset again, Yes, you can. If you look at it as an adventure, if you look at it like, oh, this is a different path. Um, yeah, it's lovely. It is an adventure. Yeah. It is an adventure. I mean, yes, you've got textbooks. You've got your own, you know, your mother or your aunt or your grandmother's telling you what it's like to have a child. But until you have your own child, nothing prepares you for it. No, no. I... And, and an adventure is just that, isn't it? You're going on adventure. You don't know what there is to come. No. And I, I remember when my, when, you know, Viraj was born, you have all these preconceptions. But when I looked at him in the crib that night, I thought, I'm responsible for you for the next 18 years of my life. Yes. Of your, sorry, of your life. And it was like, oh, my God. And it kind of like, whoa, what's just happened? Yeah. You weren't here yesterday, and now you're here, yeah. you're alive, and you know th this is it. Yeah. So it's it's um like you say, it's an adventure, but it's how you handle it, yeah. how the mindset. You're, you're very right about that. Um, can I just ask you? You obviously being Dutch, mm -hmm. Sean being English, mm -hmm. you've brought your children up in England. How how has that been? The, the different cultural um differences or the way you were brought up the way sean was brought up how has that played into the two of you bringing your children up yeah very interesting question and also it's three cultures so sean is very maltese yes. i know he's english but his mom and dad immigrated to malta and they took on the maltese lifestyle the full hundred percent so his both two sisters are still there and they have grown up with the Maltese um, environment. So it's pretty much me being Dutch and I still see Sean as Maltese, strangely enough. And we're bringing our children up in England. So our family support are in other countries. And I yes, think that, that is was... really, really different. But I can't compare it because I don't know anything else. So with Sana, I started talking Dutch to her and mm -hmm. she's picked up a lot of the Dutch language and I've always tried to incorporate some Dutch culture in there. At the same time, we've always visited Malta and the Netherlands um, and very much brought them up in that culture as well. So they know about the Dutch family. We're very connected they, yes. I, so for example, there's words in Dutch, because I stopped talking Dutch when I knew Noah had difficulties, because I wasn't sure how that was going to affect him. So, but there's certain words like, they don't use dessert, for example, we use toetje. And they, do, and they don't know any other day. So there are different Dutch words and phrases and sentences that they use. It's more apparent with me, because I do the majority of the the, the um, uh, yeah, be, I'm being here, where Sean works, of course. Doing but, the parenting. Yeah, the par yes. yes, thank you. I just couldn't get yes. the words out there. That's okay. That's my Dutchness shining through. <laughs> um, but when we go to Malta, it's very Maltese. So they grew up with different languages where, you know, the, Sean speaks a bit of Maltese, a bit of Italian. I speak a bit of French and a bit of German. And we always throw that in. So they... It's fantastic. It's what we also have is I'm trying to encourage them to be open, yeah, to to ex accept everybody how they are. Um, yes. Maybe not different from England, but sometimes when you are growing up in a country and you live there and you stay there all your life, 
it's sometimes different to expand that mind view. It doesn't matter what country you're in. So if I go back to the Netherlands and I speak to my family, especially my, my close family, my brothers and my sisters, although yes. they come across and their words are very open, you can see that they are constricted logically by where they live. And we have three countries. So my children yes. have three nationalities. And that is that sometimes you really see. So it is, yes. I struggled because, and it's again, I see it as an adventure again. So my eldest, Susanna, goes to a school. I have no idea about the school system. I went to school without a uniform. I, I, I don't see it. I didn't go to school in, um, you know, we went to school with different timings. So secondary school for me, I went out of the door by 7.30. I was home at 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night. Here they leave school at 3. It's, it's different for me. In the Netherlands, the primary school kids, not it's changing now, but I grew up with going to school of going home for lunch. I was home at 12 and went back to school at 1.30. So there are tiny differences like that. Yes, definitely. And when we see your family, you know, when I see your family, I, we definitely see the three cultures, it, you know, coming together in, on, in your household. And it, it's beautiful to see that. But, and I've always, the way you have brought your children up, like you say, to be open, free-spirited, it all comes across you know and we can see that I mean we, we met only last week yes. and it's been a while since we've met but you know seeing the children now 16 and 13 and we were able to go out for dinner and sit around the table it was just we've, we've never done that I don't think because no. I'd been at your house or my house because the kids were too young yes but we've had some great times with the children in the garden playing you know and my boys are obviously older but they've taken to them really well yeah. every time they've met you know um touching back on um what you mentioned earlier tiger mom yes would you like to expand a bit on that yeah so obviously i'm going back obviously to my worry child noah is it's incredibly difficult to get the right support and i'm sure you've had the same when some year i was growing up you're talking more primary school. Mm. When, when the medical profession doesn't find anything that is in their books, they let you go. So if it's unexplainable, they, the effort is getting less and less. And one, one moment in Noah's life really hit that. It was a turning point for me. It's a very emotional point for me as well. So Noah was always under the care of a specialist and he was in primary school and I could see it was going wrong. You know, he was eight, mm -hmm. nine years old and I could see he was getting depressed, frustrated. The school was too small to cater for his needs and I'd never really fully investigated because you don't want too much intervention with a young child. Um, so I'd never checked if, for example, if they can't find something, because sometimes there's an undiagnosed brain issue that's, yes. that's there. So I was like, okay, let me see if there's an MRI. You know, I tried to get him physically really all tick boxes that he's got a clean, you know, bill of health there. Physically, he's 100% because then I can focus on what really is to supporting him because otherwise you're you're groping in the dark and i remember yeah. going back to the specialist coming in he's up till that point always been very supportive very friendly very accommodating the first words when i came in and it was literally phrased like this what are you doing here in that voice so i voiced my worries that he's getting quickly tired he is depressed and i'm worried and he said Okay, Noah, running down up the hall. And Noah did that. And he's like, well, he's looking fine. He's looking tired. And I was like, right. <laughs> okay. Then we walked in. And while he was examining Noah, while I kind of 
because that's what you do now, isn't it? You Google things. I Google things. I don't like to mention it to doctors yeah. and specialists because, you know, they don't like that kind of self-diagnosing. So I always hold back. And I was like, well, I read something new. Do you think it can be that? And he was like, do you know what the problem is? He said, you are the problem. It's your fault that Noah is the way he is. And <gasps> I, I just, I didn't know what to say. Noah was there at the time, and I was like... Were you on your own? Yeah. Like, was Sean there? No. So never again. That is... If anybody listening to this has to go through the same thing, I say, always take somebody with you or record yes. it. So I've learned my lesson. I was I was in shock. I was honestly in shock. I have no idea how I got home. I remember going to Winchester, getting out of the bus, because I was like, I, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. Went to a cafe, and I know I was talking to Noah. We're going to have a great time. Do you want a drink? Do you want to have lunch? And in Wardley, I was broken. I was yeah, numb. He would be with, yeah. I was completely numb. So I phoned a good friend of mine mm, as a witness more than anything else. And she was there for me. And I've never talked to anybody about this, really, because I was, I was like, oh, my God. But it was a turning point. I was like, right, that's it. So I'll do it myself. But that, was that all he said to you and yeah. then you left? Yeah, he didn't do anything. So oh. he did do the MRI, and that was an awful experience because mm. nowhere on top of that at the time, he's much better now, was very sensitive. So sensitive to, he was sensory sensitive. Yes. Yeah, so everything yeah. was too hard or too rough for clothing. Everything was too loud. He can't stand shouting. He still can't stand it. And they put his head on a really hard plastic thing. I don't know if you've ever done an MRI, but it's really scary. I haven't, but I know, I yeah. know what it's like. I've seen them being done. So yes. he clicked a button that he was uncomfortable and they didn't listen to him. So they left him in there. So it was a really awful, awful experience. But I put it behind me. And I was like, right, the only way forward is forward, not looking back. So I'm looking forward. Found, yeah. And then I was like, right, I'm doing it myself. So found another school, private school for dyslexic children. Um, and the council just didn't want to know. Got support from them. School closed. <laughs> So I had to find the another school. school. You, yeah, so that, the, the private school that, that you sent him to so yeah, closed down. Yeah, that perfect oh. school. It was a school for dyslexic children. Oh. Closed down. He went to another school, and I'm not going to go there because it was the most awful school I've ever seen for children like Noah. And then was the point for secondary school. And I found another secondary school. I was poised to go, and I got a letter that says... Um, you are not automatically going to that school. And then is when I phoned up, complained, went in, had meetings, and I wasn't having it. I wasn't having it. I wasn't budging. So I was like, he will go to that school, and I'm not leaving until he's going there. I had it all was set up. a particular school? Yes. Was he, this a particular school you wanted to yeah. that help that was yeah. going to cater to his needs? Yes. So it's a normal mainstream school. So if you think about a child mm -hmm. that I thought was mentally and physically disabled is now in a mainstream school. Mm. And it's purely because I knocked on every door that I can knock on until yes. I got what I wanted. And I still don't get what I wanted. And I, I used the word tiger mom because I used it for my other children as well. So if I feel that it that they are treated unfairly, then I phone. I want an explanation of why. And if I'm yeah. not happy with the explanation or if I get an answer, well, that's the way it is, then I have a meeting and I will not back down. It's not that I am always right, but you need to explain to me why. So for me, it's all about communication. And if yes. if I don't get communication from the school, then I will 
make sure I get that communication. Otherwise, it's not going to work for me. It's a two-way, and that's with school, but it's also with doctors, GPs, friends, parents, everybody surrounding my family. If there's something happening that I'm not happy with or that makes me feel hurt or that makes my child unhappy, then we talk about it. And if you can tell yes. me why, I'm absolutely fine. But otherwise, yeah, you got me in my in your face. <laughs> <laughs> it is the way it is. So is Noah now settled in the school that he's at? Are you happy with the provisions they're providing? They are him? amazing. And this is a mainstream school, yes. you said. They have a special um, unit for is it a private school no. or a state school? State school. State, state school. school, yeah. Okay. Um, Private schools are, to be honest with you, unless you go to a private school for special needs children, yeah, they don't cater for you. They don't cater Otherwise for you. They don't cater. Otherwise, That's they don't cater for you. Had. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly the experience we had with Samir, where he wasn't able to speak, he wasn't able to read, he was in reception at a local uh, private prep school um and we took him we took him out and we put him in the local state school yeah. within six weeks he was reading exactly and then everything's it... on top yes you know um when you're in a private school and it just didn't work for us yeah but sorry uh, back back to noah so he's in a mainstream school and yeah. he has um he's... all the provisions that yeah. he needs so if you have to think about he is in a different school than my daughter because yeah. That is also a mainstream school, but I call it the school with the stick and the school with the carrot. So what my daughter is, it's the school with the stick. If you don't do this, <laughs> then you will be disciplined. Whereas my, the school where my son is, is like doing amazing. You could do better, but you're doing amazing. So Noah went to that school because that last school where he was regressed him. So after the private school, he did really well. Went to year six in the other school, they regressed him. He went to a pro to secondary school, year seven, not able to read, not able to write. Yeah, he is doing everything at the moment, bar reading and writing. But he is on the same level as the other kids with knowledge of science and history and geography. He just has to work a lot harder because he finds it difficult to read and write. Mm. But we just had parents' evening, and the only thing we heard was praise. His attitude is amazing. He is so hardworking. He's resilient. He is determined. And that's because he had these extra needs. He always had to work hard to get a low result. So... Yeah, but he's got very supportive parents. Yes, like you say now putting Tiger Mum into context. <laughs> I, I mean that there is the book Tiger Mum, if you know. It, no, I don't. Chinese... I don't oh, know it. That, that's what I thought you were referring no, to. No, I don't know it um, at all. I, I haven't actually read it. I, I should do one day, even though my children have grown up. But there is a book called Tiger Mum. It's about a, I think she's a Chinese mother. Okay. Um. Maybe yours were quite young when that book came out. Um, and it's how these girls, I think she has two daughters, and the things that they have to do, all the extracurricular, mm. and how many hours of it they have to do. And the book is actually called Tiger Mum. But I get where you're coming from when you say Tiger Mum in the sense of you will fight tooth and nail for your children. And, Absolutely. You know, that is, I, I've done the same. I've done the same. Samir's problems and, and needs got got sorted out yeah. you know but if it wasn't for us or it wasn't for me getting the speech therapist getting an occupational therapist in um he would have you know the private school would have taken all our money yes and not done anything no exactly but we we and you know when we when we said we're, we're leaving and we're taking both the boys out of private school oh but why do you want to take Virage? because he was good for their statistics wasn't he exactly and that is what it's you all know? about but samir wasn't so he can go but you no know, we'd like this one we were like no they're both going to go and they are successful in their own rights today exactly and, you know seeing noah i i can't remember when we last saw him but gosh what a difference i know you know 
Um, I, I think last time speech was much more, you know, I could I we couldn't understand, but he was so clear yeah. when he was talking last week. Yeah. You know, I was able to have a conversation and it was just lovely, absolutely lovely experience with him. And it was and you know, when we left your house, I said to I said to my husband, I said, it was just so calm. Huh. And I think there's been this gap between them being little and us not seeing them. And all of a sudden they've yes. grown. There's this leap has gone where they're 16 and 13. And obviously Quinn wasn't there. It might have been different dynamics. It would definitely have been a different dynamic. Completely different child. <laughs> I have a photo of him sitting in our garden in the wheelbarrow and Samir's trying to push yes. him. <laughs> that, that says it all. <laughs> but... Um, it's yeah you you have to you have to uh, you know it's but but it's really hard as well because you know i mean did you did you ever follow up on that doctor i sent in or did you put that i did put it behind me so what i did i firmly believe in that i wrote it mm. all in a document so literally all my frustrations all my words that normally have beep in them if they would be um, publicized but i normally do that just get it all off my chest um no i'm not done with it because i am very much what we don't have nish what i really Mm. somewhat we don't have is mum for mums mothers for mothers so somewhere in the world there are mothers who go through exactly the same as you and i went through yeah. Yes, so the, there are there are loads of them. They're reinventing the wheel, and that is something I find so difficult because I've met because I'm I am in that in that Zen world. Yeah, I'm in that in that world of special needs children. I'm also in yes. the world of the high able because Sana is that high academic mm-hmm. child, and I'm in the world of the middle kids because Quinn is firmly in the middle. Yeah, and the. the I think what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't be having to reinvent that world. We shouldn't have to to do that. Is um, being a mum from a child with special needs, there is no support group as such. So I have outside support groups, which is lovely, all these experts yes. and specialists, but they're not the mother of my child and they do not understand the emotional feelings that go with them so the support might be there but not the understanding as such no the the empathy is not there unless you have a child with those needs or something similar yeah you can be on the same page talking about the same things yeah and i think you've got a perspective of three very different abilities yes Um, and you actually can have a conversation with all three types of parents, but there are some parents who can't. They just will only be able to have that. They, they won't under, under, even understand special needs. Exactly. They don't have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, or they've got a really high able child and they can't understand the, the middle range. Yes, exactly. And um, a lot of parents, what I've seen, because as you know, I'm quite direct. Yeah. And I've got a couple That's of friends. That's a Dutch in you. That's a Dutch in me. And That's I've, a Dutch in you. I've toned it back. Trust me, I've toned it back. Uh, down, even. You see, I'm getting <laughs> on my Dutch list now. Um, so I have friends who put their head in the sand. And I'm looking yes. at a child, because I have the experience. I'm looking at a child who's like, mm. if I were you, I'd push that. Because unless you have a plan, you do not get the support. So you need that special support from the council. And that is the fight that a lot of parents don't have because Hampshire is notorious for saying no. You really have to push and push and push and push. And that's why my, it's, that's so unfair. That is just not right. But, you know, coming back on, on the motherhood of my three kids, the, the bit that I really, really enjoy is the ability to give them a broad experience of what life is all about. So we've traveled. Um, they do activities, trying to find out what makes them tick, you know, trying to yes. 
find out what works for them. So they do music and drama and dance. And, you know, just quickly coming back to Noah, it's the singing that made a difference to his speech. So he's doing singing lessons and that teacher has really made a difference to him. But Quinn, for example, does drama and, and dance. And in lockdown, you know, for example, he discovered the, the uh, dress up box from Sana. We still have the, the princess dresses. So uh -huh. he would change in them and then jump into Sana's room and in this pink dress and he couldn't care less. Or it is, fantastic. it's break the rule day in school and oh. it's fantastic. So they have to pay a pound for every rule day break. So it could be they come in the trainers or they, um, they come in the normal clothes. That's too quick already. They eat, they eat tutje or dessert before their main meal. That's another pound. Or they dye their hair. So Quinn was like, Mom, I want to dye my hair and paint my nails. I was like, <gasps> are you sure? Yes. So he dyed his hair pink and had nail polish on. And I was like, to have that confidence as a 10-year-old yes. to go into school like that, I love it. Love it. I've never heard of that one, Break the Rules. That I know. I think it's fantastic. I fully supported it. Gave him the full 10 quid just, you know, for <laughs> you quid. Yeah, for everything. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a pout, but I was like, right, any rule you can break, my darling, go for it. So he went in trainers and shorts and had his hair pink and a tattoo on his arm and everything he wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> and then it's, it's fantastic. And then Sana going to the prom. Mom, I'm going to wear this to the prom. And she comes down in black trousers. And a purple satin blouse. And I was like, if you're happy with that, high heel boots. And I was like, that's fine. Are you sure you don't want to dress, darling? No, I feel comfortable and happy in this. I was like, brilliant. Good for her. Exactly. Good for her. She's, she's confident in her own yeah. right. She's not conforming or peer pressure. Exactly. You know, because it's, um, it's, it's a horrible place out there it's sometimes. It's a minefield. You know, when you have to feel that you're not fitting in or people make yeah. make you feel you don't fit in or you know you're not conforming to the norm and hey credit to them honestly and and to you and to you and to Sean for the way you have brought your children up but this is where I think the culture the Dutch culture plays a, a big part because I, I know from from you other Dutch friends having visited the Netherlands you guys are open, you're out there, you're not shy, No. you know, um, and it's such a great culture. I mean, I, I love the Netherlands, well, Amsterdam is as far as I've been. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's not quite the Netherlands, Nish. <laughs> no, I know, but, you know. I have to take you into the country, <laughs> into the wild but woods. Are, but, and uh, the thing I love about your children is they will try every type of cuisine. Yes. It's fantastic. Yes, they don't have a they choice. They great. Talking about they are great. Talking about Tiger Mom, I'm also that to my kids, and it's eat that or go hungry because that's what I will not be one of those moms that cooks three meals per day for yeah. each child. So they have to try everything. It is ah, oh, you need to when you Absolutely. live when you live life to the full. It's everything. It's using all your senses. But just coming back to you for a moment, Nishma. And, yes. you know, you've brought, you've been brought up in England and you brought your kids up in England. But having seen, because I'm, I'm an observer with all my chatting and talking, I do observe. Your yes. boys do stand out from a lot of boys their age. They are an absolute joy to be with. They are open, happy to engage with everybody. They can talk to my little children, even when they were younger. They talk to me. They talk to Sean. They would happily talk to my elderly neighbor of 80 years old. They are a joy. They are different than a lot of kids of their age. I know. So you and me talking to each other, I don't think we're representative to as such, the English culture as such? Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Um, I think 
the way we've brought our children up, you and I, I think, is to enter, integrate anywhere that they go. Mm. Um, and that's what we've done. Yes, we, I wasn't obviously born in this country, nor was my husband, but um, the children are born here. But I, I've been in this country since I was five months old. I very much have my, my Indian roots and my heritage, but I also have the the English way of life, I guess. Mm. But it's how we, we integrated into yes. it. I could have been very, very Indian and it could have gone one way. I could have been very, very English and it could have gone another way. But I, I feel I've got a really nice balance. And yes. that's thanks to my parents in a way. I, although when I was younger, I would go to school. But the minute I came home, I had to switch to speaking Gujarati, yeah. my mother tongue. Um, but I was fluent in both, both languages. I even went to Saturday school. I got a GCSE in Gujarati. It was a chore and a half, but I did it. <laughs> um, you know, and but yet we were we were integrated. We did Diwali. We did Easter. We did Christmas. Yes. We did all the festivals. Yes. We totally immersed ourselves in everything. And that's what I've done with my children. You know, and I guess when we were younger, we didn't travel as much, but we've been able to travel a lot more with our children mm. and it's um it's seeing the world isn't it, it? And is. that I think makes you very open yes. to different cultures and uh, yeah and that's what I've done you know we people will say oh do you celebrate Christmas I said yes I have I do everything yes. or I have everything except I don't do the turkey on Christmas no, day but neither but do we the meal the, <laughs> or the chicken I mean we're a vegetarian household but you know, we have a Christmas tree, we have presents, but then we have the same for Diwali. Yes. You know, yes. Um, it's and they understand. And we have many other festivals that we celebrate in our in the Hindu calendar. Um, and they know about it. Um, we may not now necessarily get to go and, and do all these things, but they know. My eldest lived in India for a year and that really opened up his eyes. And you're going to meet him next week. Oh, and God, you will, yes, I can't you'll wait. have so much to talk to him about. Um but yes, I think you're right. Um, we are a, a, a mix, mm. aren't we, of, of different cultures. Yes, it's... And that does, if you, I mean, it'd be quite interesting to see how the children see it from their point of view. Yes, I did talk, we do talk about it. We do talk about it. And really amazingly, so as you know, I stopped talking Dutch, unfortunately. So Sana... I stopped talking Dutch to when she was two, three years old. So the first two years of her life, she had a lot of Dutch language. Yes. She still knows it. It's from baby onwards, she still knows it. She can switch. She's not fluent. The other two, obviously not. But when I start talking Dutch, they understand. And it's mm. such an amazing, amazing thing. They know you. So they have this taste and feeling of, of the of the Indian culture. Yes. Um, they are accepting, and I think that's what it is. I think what it is is conveying that message. What we probably both of us probably did, you know, subconsciously is everybody's different. It's good to be different, and it's mm -hmm. amazing. And funnily enough, I just had this this conversation with Noah this morning. Where I said, you know, you, we're all different. You're different. Mom is different. Daddy is different again. Can you see that? He said, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I said, don't you think it would be really boring if we only have Noah's around? And he looked at me. He's like, oh, that's a very strange concept. <laughs> but it is that way, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. just accept people who they are. And as long as they know the difference between right and wrong, then you're happy anywhere, really. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think the world is needs to be more of that, accepting, not judging. Yes, yes, definitely. No matter what your creed, your colour, your, your religion, um, we can see around the world what is going on it's, due, to, uh, due to these things. Yeah. Um, and I think the world is changing with what's going on. It has People changed. People are becoming more aware. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I, I work in a school and um, it's just a, a video I watched about um, it's a boarding school. And there were some 
girls with their house, head of house just talking about race. They were just having a Sunday morning chat about race and she's recorded it for other boarding houses to, to be able to do this. We have a, quite a good representation of Afro-Caribbean yes. um, children and, and they were talking it from their point of view and it was really interesting because sometimes we don't always see it from their point of view. We only look at what the media is saying but actually speak to these children on the ground, talk to them, ask them what they want, how they feel. Yeah. Um, and you'll you'll it's an in, it's really insightful really insightful it is we have as i said i mean i, I digress a little bit yes we have these conversations in at our home as well because i grew up with discussions around the table sure yes. much less but i grew up with with world discussions from when i was able to walk and mm. talk um and i'm trying to do the same with my kids so they we do talk about those things um quinn Quinn is a bit like a butterfly, so he he's not as aware just yet. Noah is very aware. He's in a school which is more integrated, um, a different demog demographic than where Sonny is at the moment. But what is really interesting, Nish, is, and I wasn't aware of that at all until Sonny started talking about it, is the almost the drive of equality across all boards and all the teenagers from where I stand, from what I see from her and, and her friends, uh, have such a strong opinion about yes. that everybody is equal, regardless of whether you are male or female or where your feelings go towards. The amount of new words that have come up to describe yes. the person you are is like, oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, it's a it, different it's, world. Yes, it, and we've got to evolve with that to oh stay up, to stay in touch with our children. Yeah, I feel we always we are evolving. Um, we can't become stagnant. No, otherwise there will be two very different worlds, two very different generations, and we won't be able to connect with our children. No, and it's scary. It's a minefield because the pace of this generation is going so much faster than when I grew up. You yes, know, we definitely when when we were at the end of our teenage years, that era for me started, technology started to boom. Suddenly mm. the world got much smaller. The it's, it, it's a scary, scary world. Do you know, we went around the world and we had to go to an internet cafe and then fingers crossed that hotmail.com was up and running. And didn't, you know, yeah. stop halfway through. So, and now you can't imagine, you know, you leave your house without your mobile and you feel, oh my God, I'm missing a limb, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It's, That's a, yeah. it's a very different problem that what we had to what they have yes. now. Yes. Like they don't even understand, you know, we, we, we talk about this, you know, when you used to dial into the internet. <laughs> they look at us, they, know. you know, us, Sonny will talk about it and the boys will be, talking about dad and then it's like this is how we used to connect to the internet yeah. not like what you boys have now because you know occasionally when they were younger we turn the internet off. oh we still do oh well there'd be panic yeah. absolute panic in the house it's fun and isn't it we, it's really <laughs> but now they know what a wireless yeah. is <laughs> exactly exactly they got data <laughs> So to wrap this up, in a case, yes, because we can me, talk for hours, can we? <laughs> I'd like you to leave leave this podcast, yes. giving other mothers out there three golden nuggets that you would pass on as a mother. Only three. You know, that's something you I, could, I say. You know, you could have asked me that beforehand, and I could have prepared to to get the shiniest golden nuggets out of my big baskets. Um, and the top three yeah. for you that for you as a mother you for would, me you would want to, and, want to part with enjoy your children enjoy mm -hmm. your children in all their ages in all their forms in all their abilities enjoy your children listen to your children properly listen to your children and hear what they say with, with, with everything, the wisdom of a child 
is not to be underestimated. And the other one is, is acceptance. Accept who you are. Accept who you are. Don't look at other people and try to be like them. I know you only said three nuggets, but it comes with these words. And it's good to be different. Believe in yourself. Mm, that's very important. And there is this culture of um, keeping up with other mums or, oh, she did this for her child and I've got to do this. No. Or, mm. you know, my child's got to have this. And you're, you're very right. Be be bold, be brave. Yeah. And listen. I mean, it is listen. I said listen to your children. But I've always yes. listened to the advice that everybody gave me and then yeah. used what I could use. So don't... Absolutely. What works for you. Yeah. So don't argue with people who want to give you advice. Just say that's thank you very much. That's really useful. And then use it when you need to. But with regards to kids, what you want to teach them, yes, definitely listen to them. They know who they are. They know who they are, as small as they are. They are fun. Enjoy them. Yes. They grow up way too quick, yeah. don't they? Yes. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, like you say, we could talk for hours and hours. Um, but thank you for being on today. Thank and, you for having uh, me. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Yes, definitely. Meeting. Next week we're, we're meeting. I can't wait. I love to see your boys again. Oh, they are looking amazing. forward to it as well. They're amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Take Nishma. Care and see you soon. Bye. Bye.